Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number eight from our series on the Gospel of John. It's titled, Fulfilling Old Testament Prophecies, and it's ready for teaching on November 23. My name is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 16. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the works which the Father had given to Jesus to finish those very works he was able to do and bear witness that he was actually the Messiah. And as we study the prophecies, as we look at your word this week from the book of John, that we may be able to not only see who Jesus was, but have faith in him, have our faith strengthened and be able to share it with those about us. And today I'd like to pray particularly for Verna Johnson and her son Keithon, and for Charlotte Gordon and her granddaughter Victoria, and Wanda Teed, and Leonardo, and all of those who are vision impaired or blind who are listening to the reading of the Adult Bible Study Guide, our Sabbath School lessons, and also for those who are using this to learn English as well. And particularly for those who are listening for the readings for the very first time. Lord, as we open your word, may it become alive to us. May we understand more about Jesus. May he become our friend as he is our saviour. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 5 and verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And to read today's memory text once again is a young junior from my church, Kai Brady. Thank you, Kai. I am Kai from the Landsborough Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our memory text this week is John 5.36 But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. We can see again and again in the book of John all the things that Jesus said and did which revealed that, yes, the Messiah, Hamashiach, the Christ, had come to Israel. And he had come, in fact, as one of them, a Jew born in Bethlehem, just as the Scriptures had predicted. Yet, as John wrote, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That's John 1 verse 10. He was in the world, the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. That's an amazing statement. And as we can see in John and in the other Gospels, many people didn't know him even though they should have, especially because of all the things that Jesus did and said, and even more so because the Old Testament Scriptures pointed to him. This week, we will look at more ways John revealed Jesus as the Messiah, and also we will look at why some people still continued to reject him, despite all the powerful reasons affirming him as the Christ. What can we learn from their mistakes? Sunday, November 17. Signs, Works and Wonders in addition to the specific miracles that John used to point to Jesus as the Messiah, he also recorded the broader discussion about the signs, works and wonders that Jesus did. The signs and wonders, in and of themselves, were not proof of his Messiahship because many prophets, sometimes false ones, also performed miracles. John did not record the signs because they pointed to a great miracle worker only. The signs that John wrote about had the unique character of pointing to Jesus as the Messiah and to show that he, indeed, came from God the Father himself. 
Read John chapter 5, verses 17, 20, 36 to 38. How do these verses describe the relationship between Jesus and God the Father, especially in the context of the signs? First of all, John 5, verse 17. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My Father is always at his work to do this very day, and I too am working. And then verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. And verses 36 to 38. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Jesus used the signs to show his close working relationship with the Father. The two were one. The works show that the Father is in me and I in him. That's John 10.38. But also we read in John 14 verses 10 and 11, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. The purpose of Jesus' coming was to do the works of the one who sent him, in order that these works might be made manifest to the world. That is, he came to do the work that the Father sent him to do. And the works that he did testified clearly that he was from the Father. And yet, as we've already seen, even despite the powerful signs and the testimonies from many people, people still chose not to believe. The religious leaders asked Jesus, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I tell you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. That's John chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. If Jesus had come right out and said he was the Messiah, the religious leaders, looking for anything that they could find against him, would have pounced on him. Knowing this, Jesus instead pointed to the works he had done. If Jesus had said he was the Christ, they could easily seek to deny that. But how could they deny the signs, the works, and the wonders? These were powerful testimonies to who he was and where he had come from. And so to finish the day, how can we protect ourselves from having the kind of hearts we see among these religious leaders? In what ways might we be fighting against the work of God in our own lives? Monday, November 18. The Authoritative Role of Scripture In addition to the specific signs and testimonies that John used to point to Jesus as the Messiah, John also appealed to the authority of the Old Testament and to its prophecies, which foretold the work of Christ. The Old Testament is central, not just to John's Gospel, but to all the New Testament. Justification for Jesus for who he was, where he came from, what he did and what he will do is based on Scripture. In this case, the Old Testament. Read the following texts. John 5, 39 and 40 and 46 and 47. What do they teach us about Jesus' attitude toward the authority of Scripture? John 5.39 You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. And verse 40 Yet you refuse to come to me 
to have life. And verse 46 and 47, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? All through the Gospels, time and again, Jesus points to the authority of Scripture as a key witness to him. For instance, Jesus often uses events from the Old Testament to help point to himself and to what he does. The following is one case where he takes an event from Numbers 21 verses 5 to 9. Let's read that first. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. And so we read in John 3.14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Here, not only does Jesus refer to the story, but by using it to point to himself, he basically gives us the authoritative interpretation of what the story meant to convey. And not just Jesus, but others as well use the Old Testament to point to Jesus. For example, early on in John, we read the words of Philip in John one forty five, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Read the following texts. John 13.18, John 17.12 and John 19 verses 24 and 28 and 36. What do they teach about the authority of Scripture as understood by Jesus and John? What should this tell us about the crucial role all Scripture must have for our faith as well. First of all, we look at John 13 and verse 18. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And John 17 verse 12. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that Scripture would be fulfilled. And John 19, verse 24, Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the Scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. And verse 28 of John 19, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And verse 36, These things happened so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. What are the forces today, to finish today's study, that either subtly or openly work to undermine our faith in the authority of the Bible? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Tuesday, November 19, Old Testament Prophecies of Jesus, Part 1. In a discussion with the religious leaders about his identity, Jesus affirmed the authority of Scripture. At first glance, it would seem unnecessary for him to do that because the religious leaders believed in the Scripture. Nevertheless, even with them, Jesus would emphasize the authority of the Scriptures, and he did so in order to show them who he was, no matter how hard their hearts were and no matter how much they tried to fight conviction. 
Meanwhile, John records many direct quotations from and allusions to the Old Testament that point to Jesus as the fulfilment of the Old Testament promise of a Messiah. How are the following New Testament and Old Testament passages linked? That is, how does the New Testament use these texts to bear witness to Jesus? First of all, we'll compare John 1.23 with Isaiah 40, verse 3. John 1.23 John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. And Isaiah 40, verse 3, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and we'll compare that with Psalm 69, verse 9. John 2, beginning at verse 16. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And then Psalm 69, verse 9. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. And then we have John 7, verse 38, and we'll compare that with Jeremiah 2, 13. John 7, 38. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then Jeremiah 2, 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And then we'll compare John 19, verse 36, with Numbers 9, verse 12. John 19 and verse 36. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And comparing that with Numbers 9, verse 12, they must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. Not just John, but Peter, Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and all the New Testament writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, time and again, stress how Jesus of Nazareth's life, death, resurrection, and ascension to the throne of God are all fulfilments of the Old Testament prophecies. And although Jesus was continually pointing the disciples to the Scriptures, which foretold his ministry, when did the disciples finally understand that the Scriptures pointed to his death and resurrection? It was only after he died and was resurrected and appeared to them that they finally got it. Therefore, we read in John 2.22, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And we referred now just also to look at John chapter 20 and verse 9. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Wednesday, November 20, Old Testament Prophecies of Jesus, Part 2 Jesus said to the religious leaders in John 5.39, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. What an incredible claim to make about himself. Estimates vary, but some scholars argue that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled hundreds of Old Testament prophecies. Whatever the amount, the odds against one man fulfilling even a few of them, much less them all, are staggering. Every now and then, someone will use an image like this. Imagine filling an area the size of Texas with coins two feet high and painting one coin pink and then mixing them all up. Then give a blindfolded person one chance to pick the pink coin. 
what are the odds that with one pick he or she would get the pink one? No question, Christ's birth, life and death were predicted by the Old Testament, stunning evidence of his identity as the expected Messiah. John points to these Old Testament texts again and again to make that very point about who Jesus was, and also why we should believe in him and accept the salvation he offers. What do each of the following passages from John's Gospel reveal about Jesus as a fulfilment of messianic prophecy? First of all, John 12, verse 13, They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! And we compare that with Psalm 118, verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! From the house of the Lord we bless you! And John 12, verses 14 and 15, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And I guess that comes from Zechariah 9, 9, which reads, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then John 13, verse 18. I am not referring to you all. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And we compare that with Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. And finally, John 19, verse 37. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And we find that in Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And also in the next chapter, Zechariah 13, verse 6, If someone asks, What are these wounds on your body? They will answer, The wounds I was given at the house of my friends. How firmly grounded are you in what you believe? If someone were to challenge you on why you believe in Jesus as the Messiah, what answers could you give? Where would you go? And why to help defend that faith? Thursday, November 21, From Beneath In our study of John so far, We've learnt that John shows how Jesus indeed is the promised Messiah, the great hope that the Jewish people had been longing for. And yet, many of the religious leaders, the spiritual guides of the people, were his biggest enemies instead. Why? Read John chapter 8, verses 12 through to 30. What is the dynamic here between Jesus and those religious leaders? Which text best explain why many rejected him? John chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him, Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. 
In your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, Where is your Father? You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. And he spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts, near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him, because his hour had not yet come. Once more Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, Where I go you cannot come? But he continued, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? they asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you. But he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. Jesus says that they know neither him nor the Father in verse 19. They should have known both, but these men were self-deceived. They were so caught up in their own traditions and philosophies that even with Jesus right before them, doing all the things that he did and saying the things that he said, all powerful revelations of the Father, they still rejected him. Second, Jesus says to them, You were from beneath, in verse 23. In other words, however religious they might be, these were not spiritual, godly men. They had a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. But that was all. They had outward piety, but inward disbelief. This was nothing new. Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honour me with their lips, we read in Isaiah 29.13, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. This very concept is echoed by Jesus centuries later when he said in Mark 7 verse 7, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Their human teachings, their human commandments were, as he says in John 8.23, of this world. And as Jesus then said in verse 23, I am not of this world. It was bad enough that these men had been deceiving themselves. The tragedy was made worse because they also led others astray. Even though, interestingly enough, John wrote that as a result of the exchange depicted in these verses, many believed in him, that's verse 30 that we read just before, thus, even despite bad leadership, many Jews were able to get beyond it and see for themselves who Jesus was. And so to finish today, what lessons do you draw from Jesus' exchange with the religious leaders? How can we be from above and not from beneath? And how can we know the difference? Friday, November 22, Further Thought As a golden treasure, we read in Christ Object Lessons, page 105, truth had been entrusted to the Hebrew people. The Jewish economy, bearing the signature of heaven, had been instituted by Christ himself. 
In types and symbols the great truths of redemption were veiled. Yet, when Christ came, the Jews did not recognize him to whom all these symbols pointed. They had the word of God in their hands. But the traditions which had been handed down from generation to generation and the human interpretation of the scriptures hid from them the truth as it is in Jesus. The spiritual import of the sacred writings was lost. The treasure house of all knowledge was open to them, but they knew it not. God does not conceal his truth from men. By their own course of action, they make it obscure to themselves. Christ gave the Jewish people abundant evidence that he was the Messiah, but his teaching called for a decided change in their lives. They saw that, if they received Christ, they must give up their cherished maxims and traditions, their selfish, ungodly practices. It required a sacrifice to receive changeless, eternal truth. Therefore, they would not admit the most conclusive evidence that God could give to establish faith in Christ. They profess to believe the Old Testament scriptures, yet they refuse to accept the testimony contained therein concerning Christ's life and character. They were afraid of being convinced, lest they should be converted and be compelled to give up their preconceived opinions. The treasure of the gospel, the way, the truth and the life was among them, but they rejected the greatest gift that heaven could bestow. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. Number one, how do the prophecies fulfilled in Jesus' life build faith? Two, what are the three or four major obstacles that stood in the way of the religious leaders believing in Jesus? How are these same principles manifested today? Three, Take a personal inventory of where your confidence resides today. What steps do you think can strengthen your faith? And four, what should your answer to the question at the end of Monday's study teach us about the authority of Scripture? And why must we reject anything that casts doubt on the final and ultimate authority of the Scriptures? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. God's Perfect Timing in Tbilisi by Andrew McChesney Zurab considered himself a Christian, but his relationship with God consisted solely of lighting candles in a cathedral in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. He had a Bible at home, but he only picked it up to dust it. Then his conscience began to bother him, and he thought, If I'm a Christian, why don't I read the Bible? A desire filled him to read the Bible. He picked up the Bible and read it from beginning to end. He learned for the first time about the seventh-day Sabbath. Surprised, he looked online for more information. He watched about 100 YouTube sermons and was drawn to a preacher who explained the Bible in a clear manner. The preacher identified himself as a Seventh-day Adventist and said the church was comprised of millions of members who kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Zurab had never heard of Adventists and he recoiled at the idea of becoming one. Many Georgians think Adventists belong to a sect. He searched the internet for another church that worshipped on the seventh day and practiced other biblical truths that he had learnt, but to no avail. So, on a Sabbath morning, he showed up at an Adventist church in Georgia's capital, Tbilisi. He stood outside, wanting to go in and not wanting to go in. Then the door swung open, and someone invited him in inside. Zurab received a warm welcome. Is this your first time in the Adventist church? someone asked. Yes, this is my first time, he said. Great, someone else said. Come also to our evangelistic program. It turned out that the church planned to hold evangelistic meetings on that very evening. Zurab attended the worship service in the morning and the evangelistic meeting in the evening. After that, he returned every evening for the next two weeks, and then he was baptised. 
Today, a year later, 36-year-old Zurab has a new relationship with God. He reads the Bible every day and shares it with his wife and two boys, who also go to church with him on Sabbath. Zurab is amazed at how everything came together, his desire to read the Bible, his discovery of the Sabbath and the online preacher, and his arrival at the Adventist church on the same day as its first evangelistic meeting. He didn't go to the church because of a mission outreach initiative, but the church member's mission spirit made him feel welcome and at home. Everything came together so well, he said. Part of our 13th Sabbath offering this year went to a health centre in Georgia. Please pray for God to draw people to the centre, just as he brought Zurab to the church, to learn more about him. Watch a short video of Zurab at bit.ly slash capital Z U R A B dash capital G E O R G I A. Thank you.